Over the summer, we've had a look at some of the fruit of the Spirit and uh, some very good studies there indeed and some worthwhile ones. Today, we're starting uh, a new series which uh, is going to run for uh, quite a lot of the autumn where we're going to have a look uh, instead at, at the nature of God. What is God like? What can we know about this amazing God who has brought us into a relationship with himself through Jesus Christ. What is God like and how does he expect us to respond to knowing what he is like? So first of all, <clears throat> we are going to look at God is love. The sentence, God is love, appears in John's letters, and it's there more than once. By the expression, God is love, St. John does not mean that love is all there is to God. He certainly doesn't mean love is God. What he's trying to say in his letters is, I think that, that love is so foundational to who God is that we can't understand anything else about God unless we understand what love means and that that is what God is all about. But I think we do have to ask, where does this idea come from? Because... As you know, there are many religions in the world and many different gods and in all religions people try to work out something of what God is like and what their response to him should be. Where did this Christian understanding come from? Of course, the choruses that we sang in Sunday school will tell us that it's in the Bible, isn't it? It's obvious, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I'm sort of getting into the habit of dissing old choruses, aren't I? Anyway, well, I think that, that we need to go a little bit deeper than that in deciding where this came from, starting back in the Old Testament. If we go back to the earliest chapters of the Bible, we find that God enters into a covenant with Abraham, a man who he chooses for uh, no other reason than he, that he's just someone who's prepared to respond. And <clears throat> this covenant with Abraham extends to his descendants, to Isaac, to Jacob, and through the sons of Jacob, to the entire nation of Israel. And so the story of the Old Testament is the story of God's relationship with the Israelite people and all of its ups and downs. And through the Old Testament, God remains committed to showing compassion and mercy towards the nation of Israel because of his covenant relationship with Abraham. He's committed to that. In a sense, he can't get out of it. He has to keep his promise to Abraham and to his family, and because that family is still there, he has to extend compassion to them and mercy. And he makes promises to them. And part of these promises is that he is going to have one, there's going to be one descendant, the seed in whom all the nations on the earth will be blessed. One descendant, in other words, Jesus Christ. So <clears throat> the Jews in the Old Testament understood God as the covenant-making and covenant-keeping God who is prepared to show compassion and mercy and steadfast love, covenant love, that's what that means, 
throughout all of the time that there are descendants of Abraham. Now, that's probably not quite what we understand by love. There are other things in the Old Testament, of course, which help us to develop that a bit. Tony read Psalm 23 to us, probably the best-known psalm of all. And the idea there of God as a shepherd, someone who, who cares and looks after his sheep. Of course, we have to remember when we read that psalm that we must not think the lush green pastures of the Yorkshire Dales. I'm afraid that's not what that writer is writing about. Israel, uh, actually, if you look at the parched meadows of the Yorkshire Dales over the last summer, all right, you might get a small idea of what Israel is always like. Okay? Okay. That's what he's talking about. And we also have to remember that shepherds in the Old Testament is a kind of a word for the king. You know, um, in the prophecies of Ezekiel, he condemns the shepherds of Israel. Now, he's not talking about literal shepherds. He's talking about the kings who haven't done their job properly. But there is this idea of, of the caring shepherd being God. So the idea develops a bit through psalms like Psalm 23. And there are also hints of something more as well. There are some strange passages in the Old Testament, like the, the Song of Songs. Why is that book there, for goodness sake? Why did the Old Testament contain what is in fact, more or less, an erotic poem? Well, presumably, it has to reflect something about God. It tells us something about the relationship between God and his people. So, <clears throat> before we get to the New Testament, we have to remember that, that this idea of, of a loving God, which we have got so used to in the Christian centuries, was, was probably not quite there in the same form. Now, in the New Testament, this then all begins to change. With the coming of Jesus, the one descendant, the seed, in whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. The New Testament opens with the revelation that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is actually far more than human. He is, in fact, the second person of what we have come to know in the Christian tradition as the Trinity, that God is not just the one God who the... <coughs> The, the, the Jews worshipped through their liturgy, but that God is actually Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Still one God, although three persons. God is in fact a community of persons who are always relating to each other. In fact, the New Testament reveals that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit live eternally in this community of self-giving love. And that's really important because it distinguishes the Christian faith from all of the others. And whilst other faiths might say that their God is loving as the Muslims might, for example, there's no idea that's in the least bit similar to this idea of three persons eternally existing in self-giving love to each other. That's why the redemption of the human race becomes possible. Because as John writes, God loved the world so much that he gave the second person of himself, Jesus, to save us from a lost eternity. Foundational to God is such self-giving love that he could not leave the human race in the mess that it was in, but that he had to come to save us. <clears throat> 
God is love, in other words, because he is always laying down his life. And yes, the Bible does tell us so, but there's a good reason why the Bible tells us so. God is love because he is always laying down his life. And on the night before he died, in the reading that Hadi brought to us, he gave his disciples, after Judas had left the room, a new commandment where he said, I want you to love one another, something which hadn't been spelled out in all the years of the Old Testament. In other words, <clears throat> what is seen about you disciples, the foundation of the church, what is seen about you should reflect what has always been true about God himself. God, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is a community of self-giving love. You, as the church, need to reflect that. You need to be a community of self-giving love. That's our response to the loving nature of God, to be ourselves what God is. Now that has a number of consequences, and I've only got a short time, so I've only got three. Be reassured. I've prepared in my ministry hundreds of couples for marriage. And I have to say to every couple, I'm so glad that you love each other so much and that you have found each other. But I must warn you that the warm feelings that you feel for one another today may not always last and may not always be there. Because I would encourage you to remember that love is not essentially a feeling. And that if you locate love in your feelings, you might well lose it. You see, <clears throat> when we come into church, what we look at at the front of every church is the cross. And that's a bit of a strange thing in some ways because the unique thing about the Christian faith isn't the cross, it's the empty tomb. There's no empty tombs portrayed in churches, or very rarely. Why is that? Well, because... At the center of our faith is this act of self-giving love, which is about the laying down of life. And I want to say to these wedding couples, the key to your relationship is not whether you have warm, fuzzy feelings for each other, but whether you are prepared throughout your lives to lay down your life for each other. And if you do that, then your relationship will certainly last Love is not essentially a feeling. And God is love because he is laying down his life for the human race. Not because he feels warmth necessarily, because of course in our sinful state we have made ourselves God's enemies. Now having said all that, I do believe that the laying down of life is a way in to genuine affection. You see, there are bits of the New Testament, aren't there, in St. Paul in Romans is one I can think about, where he says, uh, love one another with warm brotherly affection. I've got to think of a different translation for that because I'm not allowed to be sexist these days. I can't think of it right now, all right? Okay, but please, there's no sexism here. You have to learn a, a sense of warm, brotherly affection for each other. Because, of course, you see, you are representing God to the world. And 
The, the, the danger is that if we just concentrate on laying down our lives for each other, it might appear to an outsider that the church is a very cold and aloof place. Now, that's not the impression that we want to give. So I wouldn't be critical of a church where people were sort of always hugging and kissing each other, except if they did it to excess, in which case I might say something. All right? Not much danger of that in Yorkshire. So <clears throat> there is a place in the church for feelings and for warm affection for each other. But it's not the foundation of the relationships that we have. It can't possibly be allowed to be that. And after all, we have been looking at the fruit of the Spirit, haven't we, over the summer? And, and, and St. Paul writes, the fruit of the Spirit is, well, first of all, love. It's something that grows in us because of something that God has placed within us, or someone, rather, the Holy Spirit who is within us. It doesn't grow in, in naturally in the natural person, but it, it's something which must always be a fruit of the Spirit, which is evident alongside all of the others, patience, kindness, goodness, joy, peace, and so on, as we've been learning over the summer. So it is important that love, as a, in the sense of affection, does also grow in the church. And then finally, there's a passage at the beginning of St. Peter's second letter, which contains a quite astonishing statement. He says, you the church and the individuals within it have become partakers of the divine nature. It says, because of what God has brought to birth in you, there's something divine in you if you know God. There's something divine in, in you and you and you, and you, and every one of you. And it's so hard to think about, isn't it? How can anything about me be divine? But St. Peter says that's just what has happened. And so, because we learn to see that in one another we end up in a place of offering a kind of total respect to each other because that thing within us is really precious. And that kind of attitude of sort of respect for the divine in each other is something which I believe the church in the West has completely lost and which we need to recover. When we meet another Christian and think, golly, there's something divine in that person, I think we might treat them a little differently to the way that we sometimes do. So God is love. He is a community of self-giving love. And he wants the church to reflect that community of self-giving love and to develop uh, the kind of love within the fellowship of the church which goes on between the different persons of the Trinity. God is love, says St. John in 1 John 4. And he goes on in that verse, and those who live in love live in God and God lives in them. May God give us all the grace to live in love.